I want to welcome Mr. Christopher J. Harris, Jr., who will be talking about the ethical implications of open educational resources. Mr. Harris is a graduate of the Master of Professional Studies in Publishing program at the George Washington University. He graduated in 2020. Additionally, Mr. Harris earned his Master of Arts degree in Communications from Spring Arbor University in 2012 and his Bachelor of Arts in Communication Studies from Bridgewater College in 2004. Mr. Harris is currently adjunct instructor in the Communication Studies and Theater Department at Thomas Nelson Community College. At Thomas Nelson, he currently teaches several sections of Principles of Public Speaking and Interpersonal Communications. In addition to teaching, Mr. Harris serves on several college communities. Thank you, Christopher, for joining us. Uh, thank you, and welcome to my presentation. So let's begin by taking a trip down memory lane. Let's go back to when we were in high school and we're about to decide whether we should go to college or not. We probably received a long list of reasons why we should go to college. Some of those reasons probably include to learn a new academic field, to increase our marketability, and to develop and expand our professional network. While these are all great reasons to go to college, one thing that probably was not discussed was the cost of college and the cost of college tuition. In 1978, it cost around $18,000 to go to a private college and a little over $8,000 go to a public college. Fast forward to 2019 to 2020, it costs almost $54,000 to attend a private college and around $27,000 to attend a public college. In addition to paying for college tuition, students also have to pay for their textbooks. Most of the college courses rely heavily on one or more printed textbooks selected by the professor. Many of these faculty picked textbooks come with a hefty price tag, which is passed on to the students. The cost of a college textbook has risen over 800% in the last 40 years. A textbook cost $25 in 1978, now costs $203 in 2019. So why are college textbooks so expensive and who are responsible for making them so costly? According to the same report, the money for a $100 textbook is divided in the following ways. Approximately $15 goes to marketing, $1.20 goes to shipping the book from the publisher, to the college bookstore. About $12 goes to the author for royalties. $17.90 goes towards the college bookstore for costs. The bookstore generates about $4.50 in profit. It costs the publisher $32.40 to print the textbook. $10 goes towards publishing costs and the publisher makes about $7 in profit. In the summer of 2018, Cengage conducted a national survey of 1,651 current and former college students. As a result of the online interviews these students participated in, they discovered that purchasing textbooks was the second leading financial stressor for college students just behind paying for college tuition. Almost 50% of college students pay for their textbooks by skipping meals. The rising cost of textbooks is having a greater effect on minority populations. Minorities are taking fewer classes per semester in order to save money. 
However, taking fewer classes causes them to take longer to complete their degree if they complete at all. 35% of African Americans skip trips home to pay for college textbooks. Many students get jobs, take out loans, and take fewer classes just to pay for their college textbooks. In response to the survey, Michael Hansen, the CEO, stated, the survey's results should be a wake-up call for everyone involved in higher education. This is especially true for the publishing industry, including our own company, as we historically contributed to the problem of college affordability. The data is clear. High textbook costs pose barriers to students' ability to succeed in college. Too many learners today are making painful trade-offs between course materials and bare necessities, like housing and meals. In our industry, we must embrace what students are telling us. This study and those like it have prompted campus bookstores and textbook publishers to act by finding ways to reduce the financial burden on college students. Most college bookstores offer four cheaper options. One option for students includes allowing students to buy a used version of their textbook at cheaper prices. Another option is they rent their textbooks for the semester and return them at the end of the semester. Some college bookstores allow students to download a digital format of their book, and others have a buyback program where students purchase the textbook at the beginning of the semester, and they receive money back from the bookstore at the end of the semester when they return the textbook. The publishers are also finding ways to reduce textbook costs. One way is by providing ebooks or e textbooks. This is a cheaper option because it doesn't require paper or printing costs. And another way is through the use or the creation of digital learning platforms. The 2018 Cengage study revealed that over 80% of those interviewed stated that access to digital course materials would increase their academic performance and success. These digital learning platforms have made learning more engaging, interactive, while at the same time, increasing student performance and success. Some of the most popular digital learning platforms include MindTap created by Cengage, MyLab and Mastering created by Pearson, Connect created by McGraw-Hill, and Achieve created by Macmillan Learning. Before I discuss open educational resources, it's important that I discuss its predecessor, OpenCourseWare. Open Education Consortium defines OpenCourseWare as a free and open digital publication of high quality college and university level educational materials. The first known OpenCourseWare project was developed in Germany in 1999. During this year, a university professor published online videos of his lectures. It didn't take long for open educational, open courseware to come to the United States. Rice University's Connections, which is also known as OpenStax, was the first open courseware developed in the United States. A few years later, MIT developed open courseware. Carnegie Mellon, University developed their open learning initiative in 2002. These three open course models landed the foundation for what would be known as open educational resources. In 2002, open courseware received international attention. In July of 2002, United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization sponsored a three-day forum in Paris, France to discuss open courseware, its impact on higher education, and if it would become a viable global initiative. One of the most significant things that came out of 
this form was it was the first time the open educational resources was used and defined. They defined open educational resources as the open provision of educational resources enabled by information and communication technologies for consultation, use, and advocation by the community of users and non-commercial purposes. In 2019, they updated their definition by calling open educational resources, teaching and learning and research materials in any medium, digital or otherwise, that reside in public domain or have been released under an open license that permits no cost access, use, adaptation, and redistribution by others with no or limited restrictions. There are several benefits to using open educational resources. In a recent interview, Hugh McGuire, the founder of Press Books and the executive director of Rebus Foundation, discuss the benefits of open educational resources for students, professors, and administrators. He states, open educational resources reduce costs, increase adaptability, and reduce dropout rates. Students save money and get access to materials in multiple formats, including web, PDF, and EPUB. Faculty get access to high quality, easy adaptable content that can be used in blended and online learning. And administrations can reduce their course dropouts, increase comp completion rates by up to 29% and can more easily support moves towards more open and blended teaching. Along those same lines, Ann Osterman, the director of VIVA, Virginia's Academic Library Consortium, discussed how open educational resources increase access to materials, reduces costs, and can be modified for professors' specific needs. In his article, Benefits and Challenges Associated with Open Educational Resources and Open Educational Practice, Sam McLarence discussed many reasons why the faculty members decide to use open educational resources. The first reason offered are the five R's of open educational resources. Open educational resources must be able to be reused, revised, remixed, retained, and redistributed. In addition to that, one of the most popular reasons why professors are switching to open educational resources over the textbooks is that it's saving money for students. Open educational resources provide free or low cost, which, which increases student access to instructional materials. Bob Harrison, the distance li learning librarian from Thomas Nelson Community College states, the advantages of open educational resources include the obvious course cost reduction, which helps a faculty as well as students. They involve little to no cost, and given that many students who have difficulty re reaching graduation due to the high cost of textbooks, open educational resources can help alleviate that problem greatly. In addition to saving money, open educational resources allow for academic creativity and flexibility. Anita Waltz, the Director of Open Education and Scholarly Communication Librarian at Virginia Tech states, I would like to also say fit a material is also useful for both from a learning outcomes perspective and from an audience perspective. Having a book that is for students that you teach, that looks like the students that you teach, that looks like the outcomes that you want to achieve in the course, those are extremely valuable things. Faculty are very interested in being able to say, I published this thing, or being able to say, I received a grant. Those are big motivators for them. I would also say creativity. You can be so creative with what you want to build and what you use. McLaren states that OER is one way of engaging students more deeply in the educational process. 
Moving beyond the lecture and the text, open educational resources gives instruction, instructors the tools to involve students in creating learning materials. Agreeing with him is Ann Osterman. Osterman states, open pedagogy, where students are involved in creating of information, takes a step further and provides students with a deeper engagement with course content. The final benefit I will address is lifelong learning. McLaren states that because open educational resources are open, they allow students to return to the course content again and again, before and after courses. This point is supported by the Pennsylvania State University. On their website, they mention how open educational resources can build a bridge between alumni and academic institutions. With all the benefits that open educational resources provide, isn't it time for colleges and universities across the nation to mandate the use of only open educational resources in their academic institutions? According to the theory of unitarianism, the answer is yes. Utilitarianism is a theory that is the right moral act is the one that produces the greatest good for society. In the situation regarding the cost of college textbooks, the use of open educational resources would reduce the financial burden on students, reduce the stress on students, prevent students from skipping meals or skipping trips home in order to pay for their college textbooks. But most of all, it would provide all students with a free access to their college textbooks and learning outcomes. Why not? require all college faculty to use only open educational resources for their courses. There are a number of challenges that prevent this from happening. One of those challenges is the financial burden open educational resources place on the providers of the content. Walt states, we give these things to students for free, but they take a lot of time to develop they can take a lot of time to adapt. And there are a lot of things that go into making something a quality learning resource. In addition to cost, the return on investment is an additional challenge that costs colleges and universities face. Harrison states, another disadvantage is a strong silo mentality some faculty and even some students have in regards to their courses. Despite living in an age of increasingly electronic-based information, several faculty and students still prefer traditional materials in their courses. It can be difficult to build a perfect OER just for those very reasons. Unless institutions of higher learning are willing to make deeper investments in open educational resources and required hardware and software faculty will require of their students, the students are still left behind. Depending on the hardware and software needed, costs may still be high, which puts you back into the same spot you were trying to avoid. Quality is another challenge to using open educational resources. Not all open educational resources have the same quality as a textbook published by one of the major textbook publishers. Allen states that in terms of disadvantages, obviously the time to build the course is a huge disadvantage. Depending on the discipline, it's near impossible to find decent OER. Some, some disciplines, I completely accept the fact that faculty have, depend, have to depend on a commercial textbook because they really are not viable options out there in terms of OER. And another challenge for new professors includes structure. Michelle Manfrey, the Director of Information Services at Tom Sussman Community College states that novice instructors need structure that a textbook can provide unless an academic discipline can provide that. The final challenge I present to you is from Hanlon and where she states, if we require faculty to use open educational resources, there would be a revolt. First of all, academic freedom dictates that 
faculty, at least all full-time faculty, decide the content that they use for teaching. Although they have been dictates to use certain textbooks, it has always been at the coercion of discipline's colleagues and not the force of a dean or a department chair. Second of all, OER is not as robust in many disciplines. We cannot force something when good content does not even exist. In conclusion, I would like to leave you with these three questions. Do the benefits of using open educational resources outweigh the challenges? Ethically speaking, is switching to open educational resources the right choice? And if not now, when is the right time to convert to using open educational resources? Thank you for listening to my presentation. Thank you, Mr. Harris, for presenting today.